Good afternoon and praise the Lord to everybody here. Without wasting much time, shall we just get into today's session as we wait for others to join us. So shall we then pray? Father, we say thank you for today. Thank you for the ability for us to settle around your word, your infallible word, your word that was designed to give us all things. And Father, I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that the revelation of your word will be so much enlarged in our understanding that it will swallow up everything that does not seem to correspond to your laid down syllabus and how the word ought to be explained and taught. By that, I pray that we shall grasp the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the accurate knowledge of you. That is what you desire. Anything else that falls outside, that is rooted out, whether it is concepts, whether it is positions, whether it's our own personal private interpretations, whether they are traditional positions that we've held onto or denominational positions we've held onto, but they don't follow how you, Jesus, and the apostles laid it down. I come against the spirit of slowness to understand, dullness of perception. I come against the spirit of indifference. I come against the spirit of unpersuadableness. And I come against the spirit of bigotry in our understanding to understand and receive the things of Christ. I thank you for utterance and I thank you for the supply of your spirit that the name of the Lord Jesus is glorified in our meeting today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And a lovely amen. Good afternoon to all you amazing saints in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And on behalf of Full Gospel Church International, the London branch, and for Gospel Europe, and me, um, Pastor Fred, and Lady Patience, and all the leaders, we say that welcome to our teaching devotional called Epic Gnosis Daily. The vision of this ministry, as it's in our slogan, Christ Revealed Center, is number one, to reveal Christ in the word. Number two, to reveal Christ and let him see, let the believer see, all that he has made available to us from Genesis to Revelation. Number three, to reveal Christ so that you know it for yourself, so you, you can know what you can do through Christ and what you and what Christ can do through him as well. So it is all about revealing Christ to this generation. This is the vision. And that is why we are here. And without much ado, let me say a very big warm welcome to my own brother in the faith, the FGCI Director of Europe in the person of Reverend Adikulati. I want to say a big, big welcome to Sister Sheila, a big, big welcome to Hetty, and a big, big welcome also to Sister Nina as we wait for others to follow. Normally on Thursdays, as I explained, that we're supposed to deal with the, with, the, with, the, with the issue of communion, the communion table, whether it's required or not, and to explain it to see what what did Paul mean by those statements and what did Jesus mean by those statements? Do it in remembrance of me. We want to study that. But unfortunately, the person who put that, that question forward and that concern forward, it's not, um, it's not in constantly. So I cannot deal without her because she is the one that seems to have a problem with that. She wants clarity on that. And it will not be fair for me to start it and she's not here you know, and then she's missed it. And then she might come back and ask another question. So I always do this with the ones, the person that actually is not here, then I will not go forward with it. I will rather continue on our area of spiritual good. But this area, I want to deal, I want, ah, there she comes. Okay, so we can do it now. Okay, that's great. Then we can do it now. All right, praise God, praise God, praise God. All right, that's very, very good. Right, fantastic. All right, yes, so she's here. So we would now go into that. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Oh, well, welcome, Sister Sherry. I was just about to take off because I know that you requested for this. I wanted to make sure that you are available so that we can go into it. Good afternoon, Reverend. I'm in all for... <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I, was, I, was, I was about to shift camp. 
because I thought you're not going to be in any airport because you are requested it. So I thought that you will be the lead person to be in, then I can go ahead with it, but you are in. So now we can do it so it can benefit everybody as well. Pretty good. All right, so now let's get into this period. This There's a lot to learn and there's a lot to cover. So once again, I say this shortest pencil is better than the longest memory. So because this is such a very astute and technical subject, I would really beg of you, except you are in a place you cannot take notes. See, one of the secrets of growing is the ability to take notes. That this attitude that we have in churches where people just go to church, sit down, listen, listen, listen. Can you imagine that this whole piece of information, how can you remember? By the time you even close church and you talk to one brother, one sister, or buy some party outside the shop near your place or so, everything is gone, but it's gone out of the window. As you are even sitting on the bus and phone calls are coming, it is gone. It is gone. See that? It is gone. That's what the Bible said in the book of Acts chapter 17, that the people who were in a place called Berea, B-E-R-E-A, Berea, not Brekum, please. It's Berea, not Brekum. Berea. They were more noble and fair-minded than the people that Paul went to preach to in Thessalonica. Why? Because he said that these people, that after Paul preached, they searched, they searched, they searched the scriptures to find out, they searched the scriptures diligently, not lazily, not anyhow, not taking Bible verses out of context, but, but systematically and contextually, diligently to find out if those things that Paul said were so. But most believers don't have the attitude. Even some even write it, but they don't even follow the news. See that now. So it is a, it is a diligent study. It's a, and because it takes a while. Now, so make notes and take note of the Bible verses. And also I would advise you that when the recording is ready, we have a YouTube channel, FGCI London YouTube. Go back there and listen. These are not topics that you listen to me just once and go. Then you go and say, eh, Pastor, Pastor Fred is saying that, you know, um, we don't take, we don't, we are not supposed to take communion. So you are not being a good student. So you go to listen again and listen and listen. I didn't come to this conclusion by listening once or by reading once. I've been reading and studying this thing for over a year now. I've been reading and studying this over a year and I'm still studying. You know, otherwise the clarity will not come. So I advise for that. So let's get into this. Let's get into this now. And once again, please remove any religious hat or de denominational hat you are wearing. I will beg of you, listen to it with an open mind. Don't be listening to me. And then at the same time, you are beginning to compare. You see that? So be very careful and listen carefully. Listen very carefully. So in part one, if you can remember, I explained to you that the reason why we have gotten into this position of not knowing whether water baptism is necessary, tithe is necessary, communion is necessary, is the fact that a lot of believers have don't know that there's a style to study the word of God. They don't know that there's the Jesus style which the apostles followed. Number two, they also don't know that there's something we call emphatic mention, or there's something is mentioned so many times. So in Bible interpretation, we have got what we call single mention, double mention, and emphatic mention. Single mention that the thing is mentioned once, double maybe twice, emphatic consistently throughout. No, others also don't know that the epistles are the final explanation of the word of God. They don't also know that. Then also some also don't know that the Bible was not written in chapters and verses. So it was a single prose. It was translators that added it. So a lot of people read the Bible not taking care or not knowing that there's something you call the, the, the verses before and the verses after, the chapters before and the chapters after. So we call the verses before or the chapters before pre-text. And then we call the chapters after or the verses after post-text. So pre-text and post-text will give you what we call context. 
what the thing is talking about. Then finally, finally, a lot of also believers in growing up never knew that the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation centers around the person of Christ. Centers. So we call it that the Bible is a Christocentric material. Then finally, 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 We've forgotten also that the Bible is an ancient book. The language is ancient Hebrew, and the New Testament is Greek, which means that translation will be a problem. So sometimes there is the need to go and look for a Greek-English lexicon Bible to check up and find out whether the translators maintained the flavor of the original word throughout. Most of the time, you realize that it was never so. Especially when the translator is not born again and has not understood that the Bible is Christocentric in nature, there will be the temptation to insert their own assumptions. Also, there are other aspects of Bible interpretation. Now, have you noticed that with all this that I've said, with all this that I've said, I want to ask, me ask you yourself a question. Do you know any of these things that I've talked about? No. How much more are this? And let me tell you that in Bible school, we are not even taught that. We are not even taught that. Bible school, we just go through it and then we just discuss it. And then the, 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 the lecturer will just say one or two things. See, but we don't do what we call Jesus style of Bible interpretation, which is what? Beginning at Moses, the prophets, the Psalms, the things are concerning me. So we call that systematic theology. So to understand any subject, these rules of Bible interpretation may apply. Finally, finally, a word that was originally written the first time cannot change its meaning to something else because we live in the 21st century. A word already written already written, when the writer was writing it, he had an original meaning of mind. That original meaning can never change. So you cannot say that in Genesis 8.22, when Moses wrote seed time and harvest time, in his mind, he was, not, he was just talking about agricultural seasons. You cannot say that now it means money. That is abuse of the Bible. You cannot do that. It is never acceptable, right? So now, Question, how many people have been exposed to that? No. Then the other thing also we do is that in reading things like communion, because we grew up in it. So when you come across the statement that Jesus made in the gospels and the one that Paul made in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, because you and I have been brought up like that without researching, we assumed they were right. We read it with that at the back of our mind that it's an accepted practice. So it will not even strike your mind to say, wait, the, everybody has been doing it. Let me investigate a bit further and be sure that this is what it means. This is what we did in part one. So now let us now come to part two, the communion table and exegetical analysis. The word exegetical means that we are going to consider the Bible as a whole. We are not going to take only first Corinthians chapter 11, we're not going to only take the statement of Jesus and then conclude that he's saying that, you know, it is a practice. We have to look at the whole thing. We have to look at the law of first mention. Where did this word communion even appear first? And we have to look at other things as well. That's why I use the word exegetical. Exegetical comes from the word exegesis. Considering all surrounding Bible verses and considering the Bible as a whole, as one book, as one book, as one book an exegetical analysis in understanding if the communion table is required or whether the church has misunderstood its significance. The fact that something is being practiced by the whole church does not mean it's always right. Just like there are some practices in medical science that is generally acceptable, but it might not be right. So let us not go by, but everybody is doing it, but it has been practiced years and hundreds and hundreds of years. The continuity of a thing does not make it right. 
somebody or some group of people could have missed a detail. So what is the aim of our study in the part two? To find out whether the communion should be practiced in addition to receiving Christ or whether Jesus before resurrection and apostle Paul, okay, after resurrection, we're actually using figures of speech. Let me repeat. We want to see whether the communion table should be an addition after receiving Christ or whether when Jesus spoke it in the gospels and Paul spoke about it, were they actually using figures of speech to refer to something else? Now, these are the key words to be examined because this is where the whole confusion starts. The Passover, the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion or Eucharist, breaking bread, love feast, which is the known in Greek. Now, before we delve into this comprehensive study, it must be borne in mind that the word Holy Communion itself, this word here, Holy Communion, I did a complete research. The, that word does not exist anywhere in the Bible. That is even a first alert. That term, Holy Communion, is not in any manuscript. It was a Roman Catholic coinage, and we'll come to that. However, the word communion on its own stands. The word communion stands. And it's from the Greek word koinonia, referring to sharing fellowship. Referring to, referring to sharing a common fellowship. The word Eucharist, where we got it from here, which the, 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 the Catholics use a lot here to mean Holy Communion, the word Eucharist here comes from a, a type of Greek language called Koine Greek, which just simply means thanksgiving. And they use this to refer to giving thanks for the person of Christ giving himself as a sacrifice. So now, these are the questions we must ask ourselves as we move forward. So does the terms Passover, the Last Supper, communion, and breaking bread, are they all referring to the same thing? <laughs> that means when you hear Passover is communion, when you hear the Lord's Supper, communion, when you hear communion, it's communion. When you hear breaking bread, communion. In my country, they say, Confucian, no, I am basa. The Confucian has become messed up. You see already, <clears throat> you see already where the problem lies. In the mind of believers, most of believers think that they all mean the same thing. They think Passover is the communion. <laughs> and the last supper is the communion. And the communion is the communion. <laughs> and breaking bread is the communion. Okay. So the confusion with the communion debacle is simple, like I did in the first lesson. It's one of a lack of diligent study of the word of God holistically. So you watch how it is taught from the way I was brought up in any church I went to. On the day of so-called communion service, they pick the Matthew account, then they pick the 1 Corinthians 11 account, then they just say it. Then they quote that part, do this in remembrance of me. It's a lazy approach. It's a lazy approach. It's a weak approach. And it is a deceiving approach. Therefore, in approaching this subject with humility, bias must be removed. We must allow the scriptures, the gospels, and the epistles, which are congruent in, and systematic in themselves, to bring every reader to a safe conclusion. So we have to follow Jesus' style of interpreting the Bible, beginning at the writings of Moses, and the writings of the prophet, and the writings of the Psalms, the things concerning himself. Luke 24, 25, 26, 
27. In that regard, Bible verses to understand such, you know, a humongous subject must not be taken in isolation. So this is the mistake everybody is doing. Uh, but he said that do this in remembrance of me. Do this. Everybody is basing it on that part. But he said do this. You see, that's a lazy approach. You must ditch that. Humble yourself. And let's now look at the whole thing. But every word, verse, and book must be examined exegetically and contextually. So it lets you know that studying the word is not for lazy approach. In doing my research, and I allowed to put my sentiment in there, one of the glaring errors I noticed, Razusa Zaza, was that most teachers of this subject start off on a wrong footing. Everywhere I've read, I've read, I've read, I've read articles, I've read books, I've looked at it also in the word of God, I've listened to people, I've noticed that most of them, 99%, start out on teaching this wrong. One basic rule of Bible interpretation, one, once the basic rules of Bible interpretation are absent, understanding correctly the subject of communion is inherently flawed right from the onset as it will be with any other Bible topic. So when I listen to everybody, they either start with saying that the Jews practiced it. Ah, 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 ah. So they are talking about what? Passover. They said the Jews started it. Then they said Jesus practiced it. Then they'll glibly say the apostles practiced it. That is a very weak position. And I noticed that none of the people I researched and I listened to who call themselves authority, they all started on a wrong footing. None of them were aware of the Jesus style of Bible interpretation. None of them were aware of taking it holistically. None of them approached it with taking into consideration pretext, post-text, context, emphatic mention, looking at the original words, looking at it, being able to correctly divide and make everything stand correctly. Somebody say, yeah, but you know, you don't have a very large congregation. <laughs> you see how you see how ignorance can display, can, can dress you. That doesn't have to do anything with large congregation. The large congregation shows the amount of the ignorance in there. It means that nobody has noticed it, anything wrong with it. So to arrive at a safe, holistic understanding. The subject of communion requires diligent study. Because when I studied, I realized, oh, 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 I saw where all the problem is. That's why 2 Timothy 2.15 says, study and be eager and do your utmost to present yourself to God, approved, tested by trial. A work, man, there is work. You cannot do this by reading over it once. And, and you know what everybody does? I'm open to a one Corinthians chapter 11. Is it not there? Is it not there? Is it that you not say, do this in remembrance of me? Meanwhile, the person has not even read the whole thing. The person has just picked only that verse out. You will see today, a workman, there's work. Who has no cause to be ashamed? How do you do this? Correctly analyzing and accurately dividing, rightly handling, and skillfully teaching the word. So there's a skill. Skill comes by practice. So as you begin to read the whole thing constantly, 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 constantly. Not by hearsay. Bam, it will pop out and you say that, oh. And that's what I am entreating you to do. Don't just listen to me. Get this recording. Listen to it over until you yourself, you come to that place where it's clear in your mind. For me, it's clear in my mind. And let me say that before I go on. It's clear in my mind that that is not what Paul was saying. He was not saying that we should keep on practicing it. The communion is not required. But let's go into it. You must now, it's up to you to see it now. Now, once again, I am not pushing it off you. It's entirely up to you. If you want to continue to eat bread and drink Ribena, fine. It's entirely up to you. So uh, let me leave this one here. Let me read this one. Okay. So in the light of our introduction, 
It can be seen already where the problem of understanding correctly the subject of communion lies. How many know the above factors before even trying to understand why and how Jesus and Paul said the following words? Let us deal with how this idea of the Lord's Supper, which we call, I call it the rebranded, <laughs> rebranded Passover came about. And let us now, now listen to me. Now, now I'm not going to get into it. So listen to me very, 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 very carefully from here. If you miss out on any statement from here, you'll come back with more questions. So listen to me carefully. Pay attention. Don't let anything distract you. If anything distracts you, I would advise you that after they get a recording and listen to this section again. Watch this. The Passover, now we're going to deal with those words. The Passover and communion or the Lord's Supper are not the same. If you are thinking that the Lord's Supper is the same as Passover, and Passover is the same as the Lord's Supper, and thereby the two is what is communion, you are lost. You are lost in the, in the forest. You are totally lost, like I was totally lost. The Passover was already instituted before Jesus came in Exodus 12. And it was merged. Anytime they celebrated the Passover week, it was merged or it was united with a heavy, big evening meal or supper, which the Greek called Deipnon. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Holy Spirit, help me to communicate. The Passover was done as a commemoration. And we'll come to the we'll go to Bible verses soon, but follow me. Let me drop this first. But that supper that Jesus was in was also a cultural supper already. So let me give you a big example for you to understand in 21st century context so you get your head around. It's like Christmas, right? Christmas happens every year. But do you know that in the Christmas, right, we have what we call the Christmas meal, right? We have Christmas meal. So maybe we have Christmas breakfast, Christmas lunch, Christmas dinner. But Christmas is different from the dinner. See that now? Christmas is to commemorate the birth of Christ. But we do a dinner, what? In consonance with the celebration. That is exactly the same thing. Passover, like Christmas, was a celebration to commemorate something. But in order to make it special or to make it special, they always had a dinner, which they already had. See? In tandem with the Passover. So this dinner was called supper. And the Greek word is deipnon to today. The deipnon is still practiced in Israel because it's their dinner. They have it around 8 p.m. It's a very big meal. And the family sits around to enjoy. So Passover is not the supper, and the supper is not Passover, but the supper was practiced at the time of the Passover. Kadayabaya. So in the time of Christ on earth, he used to have this evening meal, which is called Diepinon, always with the disciples. So this supper was a common occurrence. So now why do you call it the Lord's Supper? However, in order to separate the final supper Jesus had or have had had with the disciples before he went to the cross, translators, it was not Jesus who called it the Last Supper. 
It was not the disciples who called the Last Supper. It was translators who called it the Last, the last Supper or the Lord's Last Supper to separate it from all other suppers. Bless you, Stashila. Bless you, you are fast, you are smart. You are very smart, Stashila. From all other suppers that the Lord had always been having with them regularly. This supper is a cultural supper which is ingrained in the tradition of Israel. It has no spiritual connotation. Just like in the African context, when you go to a tribe in my country called Ashantis, their afternoon fufu is a, is a traditional thing they don't joke with. They can miss breakfast. They can miss dinner. But their afternoon fufu is the creme de la creme. They don't joke with their afternoon fufu. So let's transpose Jesus into Ashanti region. Because Jesus respected people's tradition, he took advantage of afternoon fufu to eat with them, then at the same time, teach them. So on this last afternoon fufu in the week of Christmas is what we are dealing with. Glory to God. That is why it's called the Lord's Supper, the last supper, the last of the Lord's Supper. They pnon, which is something they have been doing already, separated from Passover. Now, this was a large evening dinner, they pnon, which was done in that week of the Jewish Passover always. Therefore, the Passover Alura Kalozozo and the Lord's Supper are not the same. Glory to God. I hope that that part is clear. So the Lord's Supper is not Passover. Passover is not Lord's Supper. And Passover is not communion. And the Lord's, and the Lord's Supper is not communion. I'm coming to that. These two existed. Passover from Exodus 12. They known as a daily evening meal. So let's now come to the Passover. Now that we know that the Passover is not the communion, <laughs> what we call communion, neither is the supper the communion. So what was the essence of the Passover? The Passover was a typology of salvation in Christ. Why? How do we know that? Since the animal, the animal slaughtered was called the Pascal lamb. The Pascal lamb. This word Pascal lamb was one of the two animals that later in the temple of Moses, in the tabernacle of Moses, on the day of atonement, when all of Israel's sin will be covered for one year, they brought two goats. One goat was called the Paschal lamb. We get the word Pasco from it, which we get the English word, the passion of the Christ. And the passion of the Christ refers to what? The crucifixion. In fact, it starts from Garden of Gethsemane, from Gethsemane to the arrest, to the crucifixion, to the death, to the burial, the three days and three nights is the word Pasco. Pasco. We get the English word, the passion of the Christ. Not passion as emotion, Pasco. So the Pascal lamb was one of those animals that was slaughtered and the blood was taken to the brazen altar. And the high priest, the priest take it to the high priest and then the high priest takes it inside. The blood of the Pascal lamb. It was the high priest, follow. It was the high priest who collected the blood of this lamb into the holy of holies. The priest did not enter. So the Bible says that we are made unto God priests and kings. So therefore, it is not us who would sprinkle the blood. It's the high priest. 
And the Bible said that Jesus is the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. That means the Paschal lamb was Christ. He was just trying to communicate salvation that will come. So the Paschal lamb, whose blood was used on the doorpost of Israel. That is why he made them to do that. And that was the night before they left Egypt, which typifies the night before Christ was crucified. Same thing. That is why this was eaten with their dinner. And that is why Christ also symbolically did a last one before he was crucified to also mirror. He was telling them something. Mirror the night before Israel left Egypt. Just like the night before he was crucified. Same, same. That was the message he was trying to bring across. So therefore, the Passover is not the communion. It was already there to speak about salvation in Christ. So, conversely, the large evening meal, so we have dealt with, we've dealt with Passover now, Passover, we've dealt with Passover. Now, let's come to that evening meal, which we call the Last Supper, the Last Supper, the Last Supper, or the Lord's Supper. The large evening meal supper, which is day pnon, day pnon, day pnon, in the Greek, is not a festival, but a lifestyle of the Jews till today. Now, if you don't believe me, I want you to spend some time and take a bus, take Uber, right? Tomorrow or Saturday, go to, go to a place in North London near Marble Arch. Huh? Near Marble Arch. The name of that place is just what I just escape me. Just there, after Marble Ad, it's a place where you go and find Arabs. Arabs. Every 8 p.m., families come and gather to enjoy day pronoun. They normally sit down to a large meal, and the meal has got herbs. The meal has got what they call naan bread. They are meats, sauce, olives. Then they play that their music. Then you see belly dances. It is something they do every Friday or Saturday. The place is called Edgeware. That's right. Go to Edgeware. E D G W A R, not Edgeware. Edgeware. E D G W A R, not Edgeware. Edgeware. Please, please. The word is Edgeware. Please, it's Edgeware. It's not Edgeware. It's Edgeware. Go there. You will see them practicing Gapenon today. Therefore, now let's now that we've got the two out of the way. Therefore, in 1 Corinthians 11, 17 to 31, listen to me. Paul was addressing the issue of selfishness as he borrowed an example of how Jesus always distributed the food lovingly during the evening supper, day pnon in the Greek. That happened during the Passover week. That is what Paul, that is why Paul brought that up and you see why, you see why. Paul was addressing the issue of selfishness among the Christians in Corinth. So he borrowed the example, these Jews, of how during that Passover week, when they were eating their diopnon, how Jesus personally saw to it that food was distributed equally to everybody with no class distinction. Paul was not telling us to practice Passover because Passover was there till the resurrection of Christ, which many think it is the communion. So this is where the confusion lies. So when people are taking communion, 
they think that it is, they think that what? It is Passover. We are celebrating. But that is not how Passover is being celebrated among the Jews. It is the dinner that made it to be exposed. The dinner. The dinner, they had wine, they had bread, among food to be eaten. But Jesus took advantage of the occasion to let them know that, guys, we are eating, you know, but don't get carried away. Me, I am here with you, but my eye is on something else. So Jesus took occasion to take the wine, to take the bread, and reinforce that you guys, from the prophets spoken in the writings of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, is about to happen. Don't get your mind in the clouds. Don't forget that this week celebration that has been going on, don't lose your eye on the ball. It is in, it's going to be fulfilled in a few days' time. So even Jesus was not even talking about to practice. No, 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 no. We'll come to that statement. Do this in remembrance of me. We'll come to that. Don't worry. That is not what Jesus was talking about. And that's not what Paul was talking about either. He just used the occasion. For example, during dinner and Christmas, I might take the occasion to talk about maybe a plan, a business plan. See that now? A business plan. And I can use the foods on the table to, to drive home my point. But that doesn't mean that I'm telling you to do what I'm doing. I just use the food to drive home a point. I just used the food. I took one croissant, then I took maybe a ribena, then I took maybe salad, and I said, this is how my business is going to be like. See? Now, there's something you must, which is striking you must notice. Did you notice that at that so-called Last Supper, none of the disciples asked Jesus for further explanation. They were Jews. They understood the symbolism of what Jesus was speaking about. Not in detail, detail term, but they could relate with the Old Testament that, okay, I remember that this was when our forefathers left Egypt. So Paul was not telling us to practice Passover, which many think is the communion, but he was addressing the attitude of believers during the evening supper called in Greek, depnum, the attitude is what Paul was dealing with. So now, let us examine further and go into 1 Corinthians 11, 17 to 31. I'm going to read through it, but we shall break it down every Thursday to get clear of it. But right now, I hope now your mind is uncluttered of this confusion between Passover, Lord's Supper, Last Supper, Communion. Now, it is even interesting to note that there is no letter written by any of the apostles to corroborate this thing we call communion. It's, you know, when Paul talks about communion, he's talking about how we fellowship with one another. Paul never referred, and I want you to do a research on this. There is nowhere Paul referred to this evening supper, Depnon, and Passover as communion. It does not exist anywhere in the, in the writings. None. None. Paul never referred and said that you receive that Passover, call it communion. Or you see the supper, call it communion. Paul never said that. And Paul was the only one that wrote 1 Corinthians 11. No other apostle said anything about Passover, about the Diapnon, or even insinuated in any marginalized sense that there's a practice called communion. Uh -uh. I'm surprised. Peter didn't mention anything. John didn't mention anything. James didn't mention anything. And there was no letter to Timothy, no letter to Titus, no letter to Jude. Uh -uh. I don't see this. It's shocking. None. There is no none, 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 none that call this thing communion. So all this thing that we have been doing is an assumption. That's very serious. We assumed it is bread and wine. And even some even push it and are written books and say that by taking it, you get healing. Oh, my days, Lord have mercy. So by the stripes of Jesus, it's not enough. Paul never, I said, write this down. 
Ask yourself whether did Paul ever insinuate, did Peter ever insinuate, did James ever insinuate, did John ever insinuate that, that the Passover is the communion and the Lord's Supper is the communion? Never. Never. There's no way. So now let's come to that verse. We'll deal with it some more. I, should have done, I wanted to do the pretext, the 1 Corinthians chapter 10, so you get a better answer. But let's start. Let me just go through the one that is used. We shall unpack it more next week. 1 Corinthians 11. Listen carefully. That's what I've done, the pretext. And we'll go through to the post-text. 1 Corinthians 11, 7, 13, 31, which is used. But in what I instructed you, next, I do not commend you because when you, when you meet together, when you meet together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. That is the issue he's trying to address. For in the first place, when you, Christians at Corinth, assemble as a congregation, I hear that there are cliques. You know what cliques? So uh, the rich ones will gather. You know, those who are friends with each other, let's say like FGCI. Let's say um, Sister Angela, and uh, let me say, uh, uh, maybe like Sister Nina, they are buddies. So when we are coming to have this, this evening supper feast, you know, which is actually, which is actually the love feast, they call it now, they call it love feast. Then Sister Angela and Sister Nina, they will plan, they'll go to Tesco, buy things, buy food, buy stuff. And when we come to church for that feast, they, they sit in a corner because they plan something. Then others who couldn't buy anything will be sitting alone. Then Sister Sherry and the family and me and let's say Jennifer, we too, we would also what plan our own. You see, we'll cook jollof, we'll cook momoy, we'll cook things, we'll come basket, we are sitting in a corner. And the thing was going on. Then those who didn't have rich friends or well-to-do friends who were poor, you know, they couldn't afford, they were never invited as we are having, you know, the, 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 the love feast to come and join. So here is Sister Angela and Stanina, they are eating. There's somebody who's hungry, they have not eaten the whole day, sitting in the corner. They will never say, oh, uh, John, come, 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 come and sit with us. No, John, the poor, stay in one corner. Sister Nina and Sister Angela in a corner. Me, Sister Sherry and Sister Jennifer, we two are in a corner. Sister Sheila and the musicians, they two are in a certain corner. And some will look, where when they came, they are not even eating in the morning, they were weak. And some of them will go back in the hunger, and later we hear that they had a very incredible disease. The brothers will not even go and check up on them, and then they will die. This was the sad state of affairs that was going. It was, in fact, it was such it was such acute and a pandemic. That's why Paul wrote to address it. So he said, "For in the first place, when you assemble as a congregation, I hear there are cliques, divisions, and factions among you, and I in part believe it." So it is not something that one person said. The account had come to the ears of Paul. Verse 19, for doubtless there have to be, for doubtless there have to be factions or party among you in order that they who are genuine and of approved fitness may become evident and plainly recognized among you. Verse 20 is where the whole thing starts. Listen to it carefully. So have you seen why he's writing? He's addressing an acute selfishness problem. So when you gather for your meetings, it is not the supper instituted by the Lord. Did you notice? He didn't use the word communion. Supper, which is he talking about? Depnon. Depnon. Maybe this translation is not clear. You see the parenthesis. By the Lord as you eat. What does that mean? In other translations that I researched, this verse 20 actually reads like this when he said, It is not the supper instituted by the Lord. Did you see the word communion there? No. So he's not even talking about communion that we talk about is supper. It's nothing to do with communion, my dear brothers and sisters. It is the day known, which is called the love feast. That is what they are talking about. This is what is happening. Nothing about communion, nothing about Passover. So this is what that verse means in the verse 20. When you come together, you are really not interested in following the example of the love of the love Jesus demonstrated by distributing the meal during his final supper with us in that week of Passover before his resurrection. 
That is the meaning of that verse. Let me go over it again. What Paul is saying is that when you gather, uh, they have thrown away. So what Paul is trying to say is that the purpose of that supper was to mirror how they saw Jesus every Passover. Remember, Jesus has been doing this thing with them. Every Passover week, they do the apron. Every Passover week, this large dinner. Every Passover week, this large dinner. For three years, every Passover, this large dinner. Everybody, And they saw how Jesus personally, who is the Ogapata, the main man, will come out of his way and distribute and share to everybody. Regardless, no cliques, no divisions, no factions. He was selfless. He cared and shared to everybody to show the example of unity. Distribute, share, meaning my spirit, just as I am distributing to all of you right now, in a few weeks' time or in about three years' time, in the same way, my word of salvation, my spirit will be distributed to each one of you who believe. Oh, you don't believe that? Let's go to Acts. Let's look at the symbolism. Acts, 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 Acts. Let's go to Acts. Let's go to Acts. Let's go to Acts. Let's go to Acts chapter two. Let's go to Acts chapter two. Look at look at when it when when the spirit was divided to everybody. Acts chapter number two. Acts chapter two. Hey, Bakaya. Acts chapter two. So it is it is what it is what it's a figure of it. He's communicating something. Acts chapter two. Watch. And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all assembled together in one place. When suddenly there came a sound from heaven, like the rushing of a violent tempest blast, and it filled the whole house in where we're sitting. Verse three, and there appeared to them tongues resembling fire. It's not fire, resembling fire, which, which, which were separated and distributed. Kabaya. This is what he was doing by distributing food to them. That as I am giving food to you here, as an example, the day will come where my spirit will be distributed to each one of you. Salvation is what he's talking about. Which settled on each one of them, and they were all filled, diffused throughout their souls with what? With what? The Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. Can you see that now? So that is what Paul was trying to remind them of. He's saying, when you come together, you are really not interested in following the example of the love of Jesus, that the love of Jesus demonstrated. Why? Look at the keyword. By distributing. So it's not, the Bible is a spiritual book. It's not about food. Oh, may the Lord help us to see this. The thing is not about food. Food was a mode of communicating of the spirit. Just like he told Nicodemus that unless a man is born of water, but I am talking about the spirit, you guys on earth will use water to wash. But for me, I will use the spirit. I will not use water. In the same way, so Jesus was just re-emphasizing the spirit again, using food. Using food. So when he said that, he said, when you guys come together, you are not interested in following the example of Jesus. How he demonstrated love by what? Distributing the meal during his final supper with us in that week of Passover before his crucifixion. So look at, the, look at, look at what we're doing in verse 21. For in eating, each one hurries to get his own. Huh? <laughs> so <laughs> his own, his own what? His own what? His own what? Supper. So where's, 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 where's the where's, where's communion in this? Where is communion in this? The so-called communion, where is it? It's supper he's talking about. The attitude. First, not waiting for the poor. And one goes hungry whilst another gets drunk. Okay, so if it is communion, how do you get drunk on communion? For you to get drunk, remember this is the this is the this is the this is the wine of the vine. It was very sweet. 
It is not commercialized today. For you to get drunk, it means you must have drunk a lot. I don't know if any of you come, where I come from, there's something called palm wine. Palm wine is sweet. But for you to get drunk on it, you must have drunk a gallon, except it's fermented. So that means that the wine they were drinking was vine. It was in abundance and we were meant to share. So this was not the way we do it today. We drink it. Wait, one. <laughs> one. Chunk the, the small bread. Communion. No. That practice was not even here. That means that there was the wine was available and they just drank and drank. But some were doing it too much to the point that they got drunk. So how can this be communion? Because in communion, we take only a swig. Mm. Huh? Look at Paul's, look at Paul's continue, verse 22. What? What? Do you know, do you have no houses in which to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and mean to show contempt for it? That means you disrespect the body of Christ while you humiliate those who are poor and have no homes and have brought no food. What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, most certainly I will not. Then he came to that verse 22, which I'm going to end with. So now here is where the problem is. Don't forget why Paul is speaking. What is Paul's emphasis? The example of love demonstrated all the three years whenever they celebrated Passover and the, that dinner they had in the Passover week in the evening, how Jesus will lovingly share in a symbolism of how he will share his life to mankind. So now, without a back of mind, he takes their mind back to the example of Jesus. If they don't remember anything at all, they should remember that Lord's Supper. Now, they also call it Last Supper because in the time of Jesus, other people were having supper. But Jesus' own was the one that was interesting to the writers of the gospel as eyewitness because every supper of the Passover week, Jesus was present. And he did the same thing. So then he goes on, for I received from the Lord himself. Now, when he said that, there's something in there that we don't see. Paul, Paul was not present. He was not among the 12. Paul was not among the 12 who walked with Jesus. So for him to say, I received from the Lord himself, what he meant was that by oral account, because the next sentence says it. That means that the disciples said it to him. For I received from the Lord himself that which I passed on to you, it was given to me personally. That word personally means that it was an account given to him personally, first hand by the apostles. That the Lord Jesus watched on the night when he was treacherously delivered up and while his betrayal was in progress, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take it. This is my body, which is broken for you, but you're still alive. Do this to call me affectionately to remembrance. Question, question, question. Was he saying that it must be a continual practice? Or he was saying that at that time, remember, Paul is not referring to that incident. Or is he saying that have this in mind the way I reminded you that the Passover was talking about me? In the same way as we are eating together, I am sharing to you, very soon I will share my life with all of you. Have that in mind. Is the remembrance a memorial service? No. Because he's not dead, he's alive. Similarly, when supper, when supper, when, so it was a supper. When supper was ended, he took up the, the, the cup of saying, this cup is the new covenant ratified, established in my blood. Now, this is where we did. This is where the problem people don't understand. Do this as often as you drink it to call me affectionately to remembrance. We'll deal with that next week. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are representing and signifying and proclaiming the fact of the Lord's death until he comes again. Hasn't he come again in the presence of the Holy Spirit? Now, what this, and I close with this. This is where people don't understand. Paul was not saying that, practice it. Listen to me carefully. What Paul was doing was what? Paul was referring to what Jesus said at that time. 
And why was Paul referring it to that time? Remember, the idea was what was addressing was what? So that you remember that the purpose which we had this, we had this supper with Jesus was because of love, unity, and caring for one another. So this statement of the verse 25, 26, he quoted Jesus. He was not saying that we should practice it. And I'll deal with some more exegesis on this next week, Thursday. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Bless you, Stashina. Bless you.